I never had a cutoff time for mm. when I was going to kind of say, all right, tough one, like, go oh, get a real job. Right, I, okay. I, I was going to do this until it worked. And you always run the risk of kind of sounding like cheesy, like, oh, I never gave up. But like, but you have to just do it, you know. Yeah. Welcome to Ireland Unfiltered. This week's show is a very special one with the brilliant Derma Kennedy. Derma Kennedy's album, Without Fear, is out now. Um, he came into the studio a few weeks ago to talk about that, to talk about his career, which is an incredible story, and how he always remained focused on doing the things that would guarantee that he had the kind of career he has today and not being led down the path of becoming... Uh, a one-hit wonder or doing things that he wouldn't have been pleased with um, in terms of his artistic satisfaction. Um, it was great having him in and he was a really wonderful guest to have. Before we go to that interview, don't forget to subscribe to Iron Unfiltered on all the usual channels. And if you like the show, please leave a review. Jeremy Kennedy, welcome to Ireland Unfiltered. Thank you. It's really great to have you here. Thanks a million. Um, your first album is about to launch into the world. Yes. Um, what kind of emotions accompany doing something like that? Um, I would like, I, I, obviously the classic thing to say is like, oh, a mix of excitement and mm. fear. But also, I just, I, 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 I'm not that fearful of it. I, I genuinely am excited, totally. I've lived with it for quite a while, you know, like mm. I finished the album early June and so I've known it back to front for a long time and I've I've listened to every song a <clears throat> hundred times and so even since June I've kind of distanced myself from it you know what I mean because I know mm. I'm going to start touring it really soon and then I'll I'll have to do that for so long and so I think it's important to kind of take some time away from it too. What is what is your process when you're doing songs like that you say you've listened to them a hundred times like do you reach a point where you have to let go of songs or are you perfectionist to the point where somebody else almost has to say it's done leave it uh yeah it depends on the timeline there are times that was quite jarring for me at the beginning when someone is like oh a song has to be done by next mm. week and i was like well i don't like what if it's not you know yeah, what i mean yeah. and and yeah i think at, at a certain point you just have to let it go there's so much i think in music as well where the best thing you can do is leave it alone or the best thing you can do is take things away from it and and stop adding things to it and making it like it can gradually become more and more diluted i think the more you add to it right. so sometimes the best thing to do people often i know this is like a classic thing as well but people often refer to rick rubin as a reducer instead of a producer mm. like he just leaves the essentials you know and so i think oftentimes it's best to just leave it alone yeah and that's but is that something that is it comes with experience as well or more for experience? sure yeah. yeah yeah but i mean i stayed out of studios a lot for like a long time because i had had some experiences when i was much younger where producers would just kind of do their own thing because mm. i hadn't necessarily come up with a clear idea for a drum part or a bass part or a guitar part and so songs would gradually lose their way because someone else's ideas would gradually find their way into the music which yeah. bothered me hugely because the best thing i could have done is just on like guitar and vocal to try like, right just yeah. to have like just an intimate recording that would be the best thing because if you just throw a lot of stuff at it that doesn't need to be there it just becomes washy i think and how complete is a song when you sit down to kind of you know when you start writing it or what you have as the idea of the song how different is that idea from the finished product it depends on the song there's there's one song on the album called rome that we we tried so much stuff and literally made a bunch of different versions and then in the end realized that the best thing was just for it to be piano organ and vocal so mm. it's this super stripped back thing and you find yourself kind of just trying a bunch of different stuff and then often it's just best to leave it alone like i said and then but yeah it can depend it like say our my song lost i had a verse idea and mm. then I just knew I wanted it to. I wanted to bring it to a certain guy who I work with quite a bit in London, and I just figured that that would be the best way to get that song over the line if I did it with him. And so you have ideas like that. Certain ones you write all by yourself, and you just start to finish. You just don't want to even get anybody's opinion. And then certain things, someone else can kind of come up with a musical idea that triggers something in you. There's mm. no. I certainly don't have a set way. Can you take me back a bit then to you know growing up and like I, I saw 
you say somewhere that the first music memory you have is listening to like Garth Brooks yeah. in the car. Yeah. Uh, like wh when do you first remember coming aware of music and maybe using it to express how you felt about things or yeah. relating to how you felt about things? Yeah. I'd say that like the most solid thing I've got in my mind of when I'd started to kind of like get hooked on an artist or a certain like genre and then know that's what I wanted to be was when there was a gig that the frames did mm. and it was on telly and I I don't even know if I'd ever heard of them and I, I, I wasn't even into music yet. I was super young, but I, I saw them on TV and I was just hooked w with how Glenn Hansard delivered songs. Okay. Um, I was just so into it. And from there, I kind of, that became my obsession and, and, and it's with me to this day. Like then I got hooked on David Gray and Ray LaMontagne and, and right. then from that started listening to hip hop. And, and even these days you look at somebody like Meek Mill or Stormzy mm. and you just, just that kind of like honesty and the power of the story they're telling it, it, it goes from genre to genre for me. And I just think it exists in so many different forms. So it's not necessarily that I'm like, oh, I fell in love with like acoustic singer songwriter. Mm. I fell in love with that idea of someone who feels so compelled to just express themselves in that way. And what age were you when you, when you saw the frames? You know uh, you? I'd probably say, oh, maybe like 13, okay. 14, I think. And then, again, then did you have that thing, because, you, you know, where you start, like, you discover what, you know, about Glenn Hansard, and then you start reading, like, his influence, so you start listening to the Pixies or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that the way it kind of worked for you, that you're just, it's a voyage of, of discovery? Kind of. And what was huge for me was, um, so it started off with just acoustic singer-songwriters, and then, say, being Irish as well, you had like bands like villagers mm. to sort of watch and i remember i went to see them in vicar street with my dad and my main thing was lyrics and that's what i always clung on to and that's what i wanted to be about and so i figured it bothered me when i went to see acts and you can't hear the lyrics and it kind of mm. does to this day too it's yeah. like when you see this great show but you can't make out what that person is saying and obviously there's varying degrees of importance placed upon the lyrics. Some people don't genuinely just write lyrics as like a placeholder. Mm. Some people pour over them for years. And I think for me, I was so scared of like building out the live show because you would lose that intimacy and lose that sort of message that you're trying to drive home. And so kind of for that reason, for a long time, my goal and my dream was to play acoustic shows in like seated theaters mm. that was my dream vision and then bonnie vera were huge for me mm. then because i realized uh, like with that second bonnie vera album i was like he's got like 10 12 people on stage yeah. and i can hear every not hear every word but it's like none of that intimacy or passion is lost it's only kind of highlighted and increased by the way it's presented to you so and you think you can because talking to people about you this week and they talk about seeing you in like the button factory and these yeah. spine tingling gigs that you know they remember like do you feel as you play play you know, you know when you play ep when you do these bigger gigs yeah. that you can retain that quality as you i think so obviously i and I'm, I'm becoming more and more aware of how futile it is to try and see what i am myself do you know mm. what i mean like i i have gigs where i judge myself vocally and I'll, I'll leave a gig being like, oh, that was great. That felt really good tonight. And then I listen to a video and I realize I was pitchy. And right. then there's nights where I think I've been crap and I'll look at a video and it's actually bang on. Mm. And so I realize I'm really not the best judge of my own thing. Right. But I would hope that there's an extra sort of level of intimacy or just a kind of a connection. Mm. Yeah, I think that's the thing. Like touring and live shows have been the most important part of this project i right. would say so um so there's got to be something going on yeah take i'm interested in what you said there about the lyrics being the thing as well and like when that was established in you like what you were when you from when you hear the frames yeah like what you're like because you know it's easy to see you when i listen to your songs to see you as a writer as much as a musician yeah. and like that you're writing something so presumably that was always something that you felt True. was the key way of expressing yourself yeah 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 i think it's i think I often try and analyze it and Bonnie Iver is a good one again because mm. there'll be lyrics that he will openly say 
don't mean anything or like he figures out the meaning further down the line. Mm. And so I wonder like how how come I'm so affected by it then, you yeah. know? And then I think, is it his tone of voice? Is it the face he makes? Because, you know, Glenn Hansard, when he's like scrunched mm. up and going for it, it's it's a very powerful thing. And so I try and figure it out. I think it's I think it's great lyrics coupled with just honesty and i think so often it's it's the it's the tone of the voice i really do and the way it's delivered mm. like the frames have that perfect opening line song and it's like i don't necessarily relate the lyrics of that chorus to my life in any way but just when he sings it i'm just with mm. him on it you know but what is that thing because this is something we've talked about with different guests on this show about that sense of uh that there's a sort of ache that you feel as a you know an artist of any kind, whether you're an actor or a, mm -hmm. a musician, that like it, it strikes at you, and yet you can convey it somehow. Is it a, you know is there a sense of is there experience in it too? Because like the difference between some people who can convey it and some people who can't, who have all the ability, yeah, is a, is a huge thing. Like what is that X factor? If you right, know, yeah. You know, and, oh, and even like the way. Yeah, there could be a million people who are better singers, yeah. but then you still get that feeling. It's like, say, Arcade Fire, like mm. the, the guy, the lead singer of that, he's not the best singer in the whole world, yeah. but like it's for real yeah. when he does it. So, um, no, I don't know. But like I mean, if you hear like even someone like Johnny Cash, yeah, who's not yeah. a great singer, yeah, it, like in the in the traditional sense, yeah, but there's some kind of life experience in that voice. Yeah, maybe that's what it is. Who knows? I mean, but is that the stuff that always appeals to? Like that sense of there's something there. There's some one hundred percent. Yeah, and but where, I wish I could figure it out. You know, what and I mean? where was it coming from for you then? Just different life experiences. Mm. I know there's certain things that have happened to me that. I wouldn't, I would be without certain songs if the, yeah. I hadn't gone through that. And, and there's certain beautiful things that have happened that have helped me write songs. But like, yeah, who knows? I guess everything you've been through goes into your songs. Yeah. And so if you, if, unless you kind of experience something potent, whether it's good mm. or bad, maybe there's nothing to draw on or there's nothing to feel when you're on stage. I, I like, I was thinking about it. I canceled a few gigs in July because mm. my voice failed on me and in a way it was a kind of a blessing in disguise I felt because I realized it was getting close to a point where I was kind of taking the gigs for granted you know what I mean okay. I was like getting ready and going out and doing a gig and all the lyrics come to me and it's all yeah. good and I sing the songs the way they're supposed to be sung but I wasn't like I think about the fact that if you play say in Portland and for someone in Portland, it might be the only time they see you that year. And so I know when I've seen Glenn Hansard and when I've gone to see my favorite acts that every single line I would like hang on mm. and I, I care about every word. And so I would hope they do the same thing. And I, I realized I was kind of getting to the point where I was singing these words and wasn't necessarily going there mentally. And so that's yeah. again, that's got to take something away from how sort of how it can make someone feel something. But does going there mentally take a lot out of you too? I think so. Yeah. But in a lot of ways, it's quite cathartic. You know, I, I, I think I sometimes take it for granted that I've got that outlet as well. Mm. You can have a bad day on tour where you just don't feel good. You've been away from home for two months and then you've got this thing where you can just let loose for an hour and a half. Mm. But it's a lot. Yeah. It can be tiring mentally for sure. Um, so when you when you start listening to this music and you see the you know, singer songwriters, um, like what was going on in your head about what you wanted to do? Because obviously busking was a big part of, yeah. of your story yeah. to begin with. But like as a as a busker you were performing mainly other people's songs yeah uh, which was a bit heartbreaking to be honest was it well it's kind of weird because i went busking essentially to make money to get in the studio to record mm. my own stuff and so that was kind of weird in itself because i figured not in a cheesy way but i'm like i never want to do this purely for money and that's essentially what i'm doing at the moment mm. so it felt like this weird it just didn't feel right. And and also you're playing in the street and you know if you play all your favorite songs and the songs you wrote, you're not going to do well mm. compared to if you play all the hits, which is music I'm not into. So it's this weird kind of confusing thing. But I did it and it was great for me. I went busking again, essentially, because I know that's what Glenn Hansard did. And right. I figured this is a good way to start, you know, and it is. It definitely is. I saw like his interviews where he talked about how much it helped him vocally and how you develop a thick skin from just 
setting right. up your case in the middle of the street. So you know? it's kind of like, you know, it's like the sort of 10,000 hours theory, isn't it? Like, yeah, you're I think there, so. you know, you're out there playing all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that stuff is essential. I mean, I've been, <clears throat> I've been kind of doing this, I guess, as a career for coming up on 10 years, mm. you know? So like, I'm glad it took that long. I'm so glad I didn't have a random breakout hit at 20 years old, because right. I certainly wouldn't know how to navigate anything. Was that planned? What do you mean? That taking that long? Taking that long. No, no, <laughs> no, no. I wish it happened. No, um, no. No. Uh, bit it like, it certainly wasn't planned, but I am grateful for it. Uh, yeah, I think the thing I like the most about the gigs I do is that everybody seems to know every song. Mm -hmm. And I have heard of certain gigs where this person will have had a hit, right? That's been like number one or whatever. Mm -hmm. And people will chat and chat and chat for 45 minutes. They'll play the hit, everyone goes bananas, and then everyone goes home. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be the most soul destroying thing. I, I, I think if I've done anything well that I'll kind of pat myself on the back for is that I took my time releasing music and, and everybody now knows every song, mm -hmm. which is my favorite thing. But like, there must have been some, uh, I'm not saying, you know, you, it wasn't planned, but when yeah. you're, when you're busking and you're, you're amassing an audience yeah. and yet you're thinking, this is not what I want to be yeah, defined yeah, yeah. by. Yeah, yeah. So there's obviously, you had sort of, you had a goal and you had an ambition. Yes. Even when that was happening. Yeah. Uh, like, was it hard to maintain the kind of vision on what you wanted to be when, you know, there must have been temptations to kind of say, right, I, I can do, Short I can do these gigs. Stuff. Yeah. And yeah. shortcuts. Yeah, for sure. It's it, nah, it can't be tempting. It just can't. Okay. If you're tempted, like go ahead, you know what I mean? Mm. Like by all means do that and, and have that brief success. But I, I think if you know what you want to be, you won't be tempted. No, nah, I was never tempted. And what did you know you wanted to be at that stage? I just wanted to be credible. I was, I was like obsessed with these artists like Bonnie Iver and David Gray, mm. where it truly is all about the music, you know, yeah. it really is like, and, and I knew that's what I wanted to be. And so like maybe a good example is when I would busk, I would see like say on social media, I would see all that stuff grow mm. like on that evening because people go home and check it and blah, blah, blah. And so it's this exciting thing where you're like, oh, cool, new fans. But then you're like, hang on, I played like John Legend all day and yeah. I played like I played like Sam Smith and Ed Sheeran and that's not what I'm about and my songs won't be like that when I release them mm -hmm. and then I'll have a following who are half interested in what I'm doing you know so I was quite conscious of that and and so I kind of stepped away from it when I didn't want to become like this big time busker who then brings out his songs and they fall on their face you know right yeah yeah but Glenn that was when you was that when you came like in contact with Glenn Hansard first time when you were busking maybe in and around I think that happened when I was about or oh, I would guess like 20 or 21 right. and uh and yeah, I mean, I think the first time I went busking, I was 16, but around then I was probably doing it. Yeah, mm. that was like when I was doing it consistently. Yeah. And was yeah. he, he was a support then to you in that sense as well. He was just class. I mean, yeah. I saw him last week yeah, again yeah. at Electric Picnic and he's just, he's the same every time. Right. He's just so supportive and, and like, it's a thing I kind of talk about quite a bit, but like, we've probably seen each other seven, eight times in total, but it's just like, <laughs> okay. we've done shows together, we've busted yeah. together and just... And like, it's this lovely thing where he's on tour now and we kind of chase each other around the world and, and mm. I mention him whenever I can and I think yeah, he yeah. mentions me, but he's just been as supportive as possible. Yeah. Um, so from, from that then, from the bus, when you pulled yourself away from it then, what did you think was the next path for you? Was it, was it again, just move slowly or were you, were you at that stage thinking I'd like to have a hit? Mm, no, I, I, I. I didn't, and to this day, I still have no idea what equates to a hit. I, I know what it is. I know what, I know what like counts as successful. Mm. But my A and R ear is awful. Right. I like. I have no idea. I've been in scenarios where I'll write a song, and everybody around me and my team mm. will be like, "This is it. This is." Mm. And I'm like, what? How is this different to this one that yeah. I love? You know, and and I've had ideas where I'm like, this is the single. It has to be. And then everyone will be like, you know, like you just don't get it. <laughs> and uh, and 
<laughs> and and so I I admit, and I'm kind of pleased because I reckon if I had a clear head and mm. if I had a good idea of what counts as a hit, I'd probably go chasing it, and that's not right. a good thing. And and um, no, yeah, I, I when I stopped busking, by that point I had basically over the course of eight years gone solo band and then back mm. to solo four years each kind of, and. So I, st- I just I, I made enough money to get in the studio and I released three songs over the course of six months and one by one. And because I was deflated from bringing out projects with the band where you like raise a couple of grand, put all your mm. money into artwork and studio time and work your ass off. And then nothing happens because you essentially have no sort of plan in place mm. to make it happen. And you're hoping for some random moment that'll just kick everything off and which is rare. So we never got that. And and it's very disheartening to be releasing these projects you're so attached to and nothing really happens. And uh, so I just put them out one by one to save myself from that feeling. And uh, gradually they started to kind of grow and grow. And had you decided then, like I've, I've, heard about gigs where you've talked about how like when you were 17 18 like you weren't good at anything like mm. this was the thing you were you were good at yeah but like was that the uh was that how your family saw was that was this like the career path that everyone was saying oh well you have to go on this because there's nothing so. else yeah i think so it's not that there was nothing else i think no you went to college didn't you yeah but again that was classical music mm. um in maynooth which like which i'd love to kind of get a do over on that because it was this thing where I was like, no, I want to like go play gigs and go busking. Right. And uh, yeah. I could have had this like amazing time okay. in college. Yeah, I was yeah. this really reluctant student. But anyway, um, I, no, nah, I figured I could have done whatever, but I just, uh, music was a very, it's just uh, like, if I was an accountant today, I'd still be writing songs and still be right. playing them. And that's the most important thing to me, I think. But it's it's from here and like it's it's simple to say okay yeah this was the thing you had to do True, but when yeah. you're 17 18 yeah it's it's a pretty and you know it's it's a pretty precarious business as For precarious sure, as yeah. it gets really yeah uh, so like there must have been some doubt that this can be the this can be your future yeah it? I mean I mean yeah yeah of course and <clears throat> but I mean you can't call it then you know what I mean yeah you gotta like at least. I don't know. I never had a cutoff time for mm. when I was going to kind of say, all right, tough one, like, go oh, get a real job. Right, I, okay. I I, was going to do this until it worked. And you always run the risk of kind of sounding like cheesy, like, oh, I never gave up. But like, but you have to just do it, you know? Yeah. And And I figured like someone asked me the other day, someone asked me the other day, like, what advice would you give to artists that are like losing faith? And mm. I was like... I, I, and it's uh, not to be mean, but it's like if you're questioning it, mm. it you'd like you shouldn't need help to want to chase it, you know, mm. like, yeah, I don't know, though. I really do not know. I'm just saying, like, there was no point where I second guessed it. Right. OK. And was there any because of the nature of your songs and like the the introspection and the, you know, that that feeling you, you have, like, where would you have considered yourself? like a natural performer or was that something you had to no, push yourself yeah, to? yeah, definitely not. Even to this day, like I was looking at pictures from Electric Picnic and I yeah. saw like my feet are just planted. <laughs> like I don't do anything. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah. So like, and then, you weren't an extrovert? Not at all. The total opposite. I was yeah. the shy kid, 100%. Right. And, uh, and that ran until college and everything. Mm. Like I didn't go on nights out and I just kind of did my own thing. Right, okay. That's always been my way, yeah. For sure. That's funny because like we had, you know, Ardell O'Hanlon was on a couple of weeks ago yeah. and he's saying the same thing like this. He was shy and he was uh, awkward and didn't, you know, he like went to a big school and didn't fit in and all sure. that kind of stuff. And yet there, he, you know, the, the career he decides to pursue is the one where you expose yourself. Especially him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where you expose yourself yeah. on stage, you know, all the time. Like, True. and what is that? And he said, you know, the, he, the feeling he got when he went on stage mm. and we have Barry Keoghan, a lot of guests who've said the right. same thing, that moment where you realize this is where I belong. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Did you get that? I don't know. The first thing I think of is it's definitely where I, I want to be and mm. where I'm meant to be. But I don't know if I 
the closest I c thing I can think of is when I did that gig with Glenn in Vicar Street. Sorry, I said I did that gig with Glenn. I played one song and he in his three hour gig. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but he brought me on for a song yeah. and uh, and I had never been in that environment before. Like it was a rammed Vicar Street mm. and up until then I had played kind of like half sold Unitarian mm. churches, like intimate gigs. Yeah. And this was a proper like sold out venue. And uh, and yeah, just that atmosphere. I was just like, it felt so exciting. It felt so right. electric. I was like, this is, yeah, yeah, I guess. I was like, this is what I want to be. I want to be able to stand up here and sing these songs and affect those people. And fe have get this feeling again. Yeah, but it was so potent it almost scared me a bit too. Really? I wasn't at peace. I was kind of like, this is mad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 a little bit. But still, but you got to go after that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you had to, yeah, even if it's like a little bit sort of disruptive, you have yeah. to chase it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and was was I've seen you say this that coming from Raku, you were kind of like you were going home there at night and stuff. So like looking back again, does being a sort of an outsider, you weren't on the kind of you weren't in the scene as much as, Not at as all, some yeah. people. Did that? Do you think looking back mm. that helped? Yes, I do. I think it helps you be unique in a way, because mm. it's like if something's going to come out of you, it's not affected by any other kind of culture or trend or your mm. mates who also make music. You know what I mean? Like yeah. all my friends, when I was growing up, we were it was like just football. That's all we talked about. Yeah, and yeah. So and so the fact that I started making music was a totally organic thing. I wasn't trying to be like anybody else. And so I would write a song whenever it showed up. And thankfully it was a unique thing. Yeah, mm. I think it helped. Yeah. And was it something you became conscious of or was it something just you think, again, it's an organic thing? Yeah, I think it just, I, that's, uh, that messed with me. Like we're talking about a year or two ago, but mm. like putting the album together, this thing of like, okay, you're in writing again today. And it's like, well, what am I going to write about? Like, I haven't, I, I, I was in there yesterday, yeah, you know? And yeah. it's like, and because I had come from this routine of like, I might write a song in a month, like <laughs> yeah, maybe, and yeah. it'll be about something, but it'll, every line and every single word will be about something. Mm -hmm. And and I'll know every single bit. And, and so I was precious to the point that I've only kind of gotten out of my own way in the last year, I'd say I've right. gotten, and it's definitely a good thing. I know people I like this. I hear, you hear stories about like, say someone recording in one studio at Interscope in LA and Kendrick Lamar will be in the next one mm. and he'll come in and do a verse. Mm. And so he'll just come in and let it go and just like think those thoughts and then it's done. Mm. And so I think that's beautiful to be able to have that confidence and comfort to let stuff go. Cause I didn't for a long time. Really? Yeah. Especially cause people were like, the main thing that helped me cultivate a fan base was my lyrics. And so I was I was so worried about lyrics all the time. And if I, if there was one time in Toronto where it drove me a bit mad because I was by myself and we'd start in the studio at 11 and I'd be up at like seven or eight and I'd go to a cafe and just try desperately to write lyrics. And then mm. they're coming from your brain, which you're essentially blocking with all this yeah. stress. So I was like, it was just totally counterproductive. And how do you get through that? Just takes time, I guess. I just got more comfortable, like, like, and and I got more comfortable with the idea of like, if something pops into your head, and it feels right, and it sings right, and you feel good, and it gives you a certain memory mm. to hang on to when you sing it, just write it down, and that's the line. You know what I mean? Right. Because it 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 took me a long time, and even then, when I finally got more comfortable, I'm like, well is this just me being worn down and now I'm cooler? <laughs> now I'm like cooler with like writing subpar things mm. in my mind. Am I just okay with like a lower standard? Right. Cause I'm being forced into yeah, it. Yeah. But then I was, I, I reckon I just got better at letting things go. But is that the thing? Because, you know, like again, that the creative process t to me always seems to involve that bit of uncertainty and insecurity. Yeah. That means like, this isn't going to be any good, which yeah. is what propels you to make it good. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And like, do you ever hit that point mm. where you're like, this is good? Yeah. And is that why you do good work? Because you're constantly just bashing it, you know? Yeah. And I, the thing is, I guess I came from an environment of like doing songs whenever I felt like mm. it. And I, I was able to analyze things for weeks at a time. And mm. so every single word would be perfect in my mind. Right. So, yeah, I... I it was quite jarring to go into that thing where you're like writing all the time. Talk to me then about how Spotify like 
the part Spotify played yeah. in your in your career and when you realized that was was happening because I, mm. I saw you say you were playing a gig in London mm-hmm. uh, and a couple of people there came up to you and said they'd seen you heard you on a Spotify playlist that day yeah and, like suddenly you had 50,000 plays. Yeah, yeah. It just like, jumped it just, up just in like a day. that. Yeah, it was that Discover Weekly thing, yeah. it was, and which is apparently an algorithmic thing. And, yeah. then, and then Spotify checked me out and pushed it to other parts mm. of the globe and all that. But yeah, it was it was huge for me. And, and I got the opportunity a while back to write an email to Daniel Eck, the founder. And I was like, it was this nice thing where I had been asked to do it and you get things like that where you're like, thank you so much for helping mm. me. But with this, I was like, sincerely, like yeah. for real, this got me off the ground Yeah, because, um, yeah. And then I think about, I think about certain artists who are like so good. And uh, the thing is, does it take just that moment to kind of flip you from like just doing good work to doing good mm. work that people actually hear, you know, it's like, I I had essentially nothing going on and then that they started moving on Spotify and I mean you got to give yourself some credit too because mm. obviously the work is doing okay but like it 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 gave me I went from making zero euro to making mm. some money and it funded everything it meant I could it meant I could postpone signing anything for like two years and i was able to do gigs in new york and la Mm. by myself and and fund everything by myself so that when this is my advice to anybody who's like coming up or starting out is like this helped me ignore labels for a long time and i went into meetings then after all that being able to say like we've done all this so like do you want to jump on with this as opposed to two years ago them being like here's a really crappy deal yeah. you want some help so and i'd would, be like yes please you have power yeah 100 yeah. percent. and uh and and yeah and i i mean i did it for years and years mailing labels and trying mm. to do showcases and all that stuff and and um, i guess i dodged a bullet in the sense because th- there was every chance i could have gone the other way and i would have gotten offered some crappy deal when i was 21 and i would have jumped on it mm. because i had nothing going on but do you what do you put that down to like you say people you know who don't get that audience like some people would put it down to like a stroke of luck or a stroke yeah. of good fortune like it strikes me that there's probably something more to it than that that it's you would it's, hope so you, it's well you know like i'm aside from the talent that it's it's ambition or it's hard work that yeah. gets you to that place where you can take advantage of the good yeah work. yeah like and and even as i was kind of relaying that story to you i was like well i was in london doing a gig that i yeah. organized by myself yeah and so yeah, you got to be doing both. You yeah. got. I saw. Um, I don't know. I'm gonna mess this up, but I saw some quote about destiny, and it was like destiny doesn't do home visits. Like that is not a thing mm-hmm. that happens. You got to be trying for it to show up. You yeah, know? like the idea that you will be discovered, like yeah. sitting around. Oh know. yeah, and believe me, I tried that <laughs> plenty of times, but it just it doesn't it doesn't seem to be the case. Yeah. Um, so from there, you say then you you like it, it that changed your whole relationship with the like the music business, if you like. Yeah, I, I yeah I, I had nothing going on at that point. Mm. I had no team. I had no managers. Nothing. And so when Spotify started to move, I started getting contacted by labels and publishers and managers and all that, and it was quite overwhelming. And it got to the point where I wasn't making music at all. I was just replying to emails all day. Okay. And I figured this is ridiculous. I need someone mm. in charge of all this. And so got managers, and then they obviously have moved through the industry mm. for a while. So they were like, "Stop pandering to labels and don't like don't even talk to them because we're doing fine without them. We don't yeah. need help right now." Right. Okay. It got to the point where I needed to rent a tour bus to go across America for a month, and I cannot afford that. <laughs> so, like, then you need help. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, but is that when you, you again like? it really crystallized like what you're going to do in the sense that you don't need to, as you say there, you don't need to pander, like you can take it slowly. You can build your audience. Yeah. Because like, it seems to be that has been the key thing that you've been most conscious of is right. bringing as you, as you grow and as you grow, grow, you gather a new audience, bringing the old audience with you. Yeah. And that's a musical thing too. Mm. So as you develop, you don't want to leave those people behind mm. and, and it's on you as an artist to, like develop and to grow but you don't want to sort of isolate those people but or ostracize or whatever Mm. but it's like i think yeah you just have to 
Yeah, I, I I put so much emphasis on the importance of what I do live because I don't really do any of the other mad stuff. I mm. don't do any kind of social media gimmicks or anything like yeah. that. I don't have some mad personality that draws people in. I'm like, I, I, I win people over mm. at a gig. So that's where I try to kind of make it as special as possible. How is that? Though? Is that remaining like constant in your life, the ability to kind of not be sucked in and not i'm not saying you know you're, you're being tempted on to do social media itself, no it is it's a thing is yeah. it yeah but, like, but do you sure. feel the temptation to do it now where you're at now no no no, no. yeah no like you're right the 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 better things are going for you the more comfortable yeah. you get and i look at i look at artists like like you look at somebody like frank ocean like mm. this essentially doesn't exist but yeah. people are mad about him mm. and it's all got to do with the work it's yeah. this beautiful thing and so obviously that's like quite an extreme example it's like an anomaly nearly but mm. it's it's like that's what you want to be you mm. can't panic and start doing stupid things just to try and bring in fairweather fans right you know but is fame itself then as funny like because Ardell was here last week, a week before, he's still in my head, but we talked yeah. about that. And I, there's a line, John Giles, the old footballer, said to me once, was that fame fame is a pain in the arse, he said. And, uh, <laughs> That's it? Full yeah. stop? Fame, well, actually, <laughs> the pain is a, pain, fame is a fucking pain in the arse, really? is what he said. Yeah. And, you know, I said it to Ardell, and Ardell kind of, you know, he was talking about, especially when Father Ted mm. exploded, Yeah. that it was, like, it was a hard thing I can imagine to ma mad, manage. Yeah. And like for you, when you want to do the songs, mm -hmm. like how hard is it to negotiate the other stuff? And is it getting more difficult? Like, can you, like, are you, is celebrity something that's becoming, it's being forced upon you? Nah, I don't think so. I think maybe I'm naive and being like, no, it's all good. Mm -hmm. Cause I don't know what it'll be like next year, but also certainly currently I'm totally comfortable. It's all good. I just mm -hmm. do music and that's it. And, and the thing is it, like every decision you make sort of carves that path for you so if a year ago i was like oh, i should do all the social media mm, mad things mm. uh, then i think you would slowly start to see a fan base that loves that kind of thing and mm. so by sticking to my guns and just relying on the music i've got a fan base of people who only want to see the music and yeah. so uh, that's why i was grateful for spotify as well because it meant i could go do these shows and not have to do anything. People were going because they had heard these songs mm. on a platform. And so that's all they want to hear. And so I just get to go out and be myself. And and so you like I've, I would hope I've got a fan base who are kind of like minded and only want mm. only want the work from me. You know, they don't want me to do anything, you know. And so the, I don't I haven't genuinely I haven't given it a thought to the celebrity thing. Right. I, it doesn't I I feel like I'm certainly not there yet and, right. and I'll, I'll i'll put something in place to avoid. because i've never seen a reaction in our office to a guest as we've had like, really? people talking about you coming in today right so uh, you know i don't want to i don't know I don't yeah but you. also like ireland's a lovely place to do this yeah. too because everyone's sound and it's all mm. it's all very understanding i think mm. and and but yeah if it gets to some like I, I I work with a guy who works with a super high profile artist and he was talking about like even in his hometown when he wants to go to the shop, mm. the security guard has to go with him. And I was like, I would call it then. I remember a friend of mine was uh, going out with somebody pretty famous once. We went to a sporting, sporting ground once. Yeah. And I just remember being struck as we walked through the ground, just everywhere, just you just heard her name. As she, walked, as she walked by people, really? she just heard her name. Yeah. So everywhere, so from the in, from the entrance to the seat in the stand. Yeah. And I was thinking every time she goes out. All the time. Yeah. All the time she just hears people saying her name. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It must be hard. Yeah, I have no idea. Mm. And then it's like, there's nothing I can really do to avoid it if that's going to happen, I guess. I mean... Yeah, I could. I, who knows? I could hate it and bail completely, go live on an island. I don't know. But do you think you can, once you can do the music, like would be a way, would, would you always be thinking, protect the music first, protect? Yeah, 100%. 100%. It's every choice you make. I've, mm -hmm. I've been offered things already that I know I shouldn't do because it'll lead me just like one step down a path I don't like. Like what? Uh, I can't say. <laughs> okay. it'll, it'll, it'll be mean to right. another artist. Okay certain collaborations when you're like i know i shouldn't do that. okay yeah and is that again like that must be like there must be a discipline and a, and a, a vision you have to actually say no i can't do that because i've seen you say you don't sometimes don't put songs out because you think that won't be the right yeah 
thing for you know that would discredit my, me right now. sure yeah like that discipline in what you produce and what you put out must be something that is hard to retain as well sometimes isn't it? yeah sometimes I, I think it's just so important to me it's so mm. important to me it's like it would break my heart if i brought out a song and, and someone i respected was like ah oh, you messed it up right. you know what i mean yeah. but then also it's like it is just music like it, so mm. Like you just like you see people with these like this output, it's like mad. People are releasing songs all the time. Mm. So you just like a lot of the best artists are just bringing out stuff constantly. So like you just like just get in the studio all the time and try your best and then bring out what you enjoy. But do you feel that like do you I again I wonder if it's like you invest so much into it that you could ever do that because it like there yeah. must be a uh, uh, an anxiety or a you know an insecurity totally. when you put it out there saying how is this going to be received you talked about how you don't necessarily are the best judge of what is a true yeah not, oh yeah but yeah. also just to how is it going to be received from the mm -hmm. point of view of this is your creation yeah yeah and even say my song power over me for me mm. was a massive step and i was scared with that when i was like oh no i hope this doesn't like like as a Bonnie Vera fan. I was like, I hope this is fine. And then I brought out Lost after that. And that's like five and a half minutes long. And that was me like breathing onto like a total mm. kind of my baby. Do you know what I mean? I yeah, was like, yeah. this is it. I, this is my favorite one. And, uh, and so I guess it's just, you just got to try and just constantly be conscious. It's just far too important to me to mess mm. that stuff up. It really is. And moving like on then, like when you go on the road, like, is that something that you see as a kind of, like you talked about playing every gig and committing to them? Yeah. But like the, the, the strain that must take on you again must be yeah. something that's hard to kind of look forward to always. Yeah. Yeah, true. But I mean, I just, I find it important to remind myself that it really is a dream, you know, mm. like I, I, I think I, I haven't done a tour of the US yet that hasn't been completely sold out. And yeah. so like our last gig on the last tour was in Denver to 4,000 people. And I'm like, to that that to me is surreal. People are like, often I've had certain things, people are like, oh, did you expect this to happen? Like, mm. And sometimes you're like, yeah, well I did, like with the right amount of work I did, but <laughs> yeah. Denver and having thousands of people mm. show up is mad to me. Like, I'm not from there. I've never yeah. been there before we did gigs there. Like, it's just, like I don't know anything about that city, but yet people turn out for me there, and uh, and it's just that stuff is mad to me, and so I feel like I just and it's not even it, the same as I was saying about like oh I never second guessed it. Mm. That wasn't a thing of me waking up and being like don't give up, Dermot. Like it was yeah. just that's the way I did it, but and I never thought about it in the same way. I don't go to go out and stage at a sold out show in America being like, come on, remember you dreamed of doing this. It's just yeah. like, I feel like that's instilled in me that I am grateful to have right. those rooms to play to. But it's just natural. It's not like a kind of movie scene where you're not like, at all. Remember, this was my dream. No. Or... Yeah. But, but then when people are like, oh, you give your all every time, it's like, mm. I don't remind myself to do that. It's just the way I do things. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so when you say, when you, when you cancel those gigs, like how, how, how tough a, call was that a shite yeah was it yeah but i had to I mean, yeah yeah mm -hmm. um and has it been something you've had to because you talked about you know just what the damp the strain was being put on your voice yeah something you've you've worked on now to kind of yeah for sure adjust. but it's it's something i'm like even talking now for mm -hmm. like like quite a bit yeah. gets me but it's like it's basically i got a bunch of those scopes in the nose and mm -hmm. down your neck and right. it's horrible it goes up to here and then curls down your mm -hmm. neck but uh I got my vocal cords checked out like six or seven times and and took steroids and everything. And it turned out the cords were fine. Mm. I went to a doctor, Mark Rafferty here, who was class. And he was, he basically, like he's quite often brought into the three arena for emergencies and stuff right, like that, okay. I think. And he was looking at them and he was like, your vocal cords are particularly good. Like mm. they look great. And so then I was like, well, why can't I sing the way I'm used to singing? Mm. Like everything was, I, if my range was this big previously, it had been cut to like okay. this. And it was so scary, like, cause yeah, it, yeah. half my set is up here. Yeah. And, and he just said, you have to work with a coach. Like you don't have vocal cord issues. I'm telling you, he said, your whole neck is just far too tense. Like okay. that whole area is too tense. I basically, I've never done vocal training mm. up until a couple of weeks ago. And, and so it, I was just singing with 
no support right. and out of my neck for two years. And eventually before the Australian and New Zealand gigs, it just. Right. Up. Explain that. Cause what would, what would evoke, where should you be singing from? From the diaphragm, right, like okay. from here essentially. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's because like, think of all the power yeah. that you can take from there. Like you'd sing for four hours mm. off that, but like, this is going to give up. Okay. So that's what the vocal coach then would work with to yeah. get you to. It's a that, process though. I'm it? basically relearning. Right. I need breathing from here to become muscle memory. All right, okay. And my muscle memory is has been like has been driven into me for the last eighteen years. So, yeah. so is that something you can do whilst you're? Yeah, that's gigs? what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like we played, we played a, a gig yesterday, and like I can do it. It's just mm. it's kind of extra work, and I'm still using this, and it's not good. But there's certain notes still aren't available to me. It's a process. Mm. I, say for example, in the scale. When, when it crapped out on me, I was struggling to get a C and now I'm in and around touching an A on right, the other okay. end. So it's like, it's just, I feel like I'm gaining like a note okay. every two weeks. Right. Yeah. So, but like the, by the end of the process or as you move through the process, it will actually not just like restore you, but strengthen you. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And should be, should like, <clears throat> I, 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 for too long, I sort of just made my peace with the fact like, oh, when I wake up after a gig, I should feel exhausted. Right. And thankfully now when I get this sorted, it'll just be easier. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like there was times when it can be real annoying and it can be exhausting too. And there can be times when you can do a great gig and you don't go out to talk to people that were at it afterwards because you just don't want to talk because it hurts right. too much. And, and, and then and then you get up on stage the next night and you still force it out. And it's like, yeah, it's a miracle. It took two years, to be honest. Yeah. So yeah. like that must be so between gig, like you're doing a lot of gigs and you're putting yourself through that. It must have been really tough. It's just hard work. Yeah. So I heard you talking to Dave Hanratty here and you were saying yeah. when you met him, like for you, was your voice Oh, that was a killer because yeah. that was four Olympias in a row. Right, yeah. And even on the next tour, we're not doing four nights in a row. I was looking at everybody's tour and I was like, nobody does four nights in a row. Like, why are we doing four <laughs> nights in a row? I sing like harder than anybody yeah. and I'm the one doing four nights yeah. in a row. And, uh, and um, yeah, it just, it, it, it around that time, I even said it to him out there. I was like, I'd mm. love to kind of do, do that again when I can actually talk right. freely because that day I was struggling, yeah. That's amazing to think that that's what you're, we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis yeah and i watched a john mayer video and like everyone goes through it yeah. it's not a unique thing yeah. like all artists have this problem and and well i mean that's a blanket statement obviously but i know a bunch of them mm. go through it and because the thing is say the lady that's teaching me how to sing properly now like she's ex opera singer mm. and she was saying their thing is to be trained to bits from like the age of 12 to yeah. 18 and then go into the opera and sing twice a day for four hours right. every single day yeah. but and over like no microphone and there's a hundred mm. piece orchestra and so like that's work right. and but they're trained to within an inch of their life so they can do it effortlessly mm. whereas in my world you have something as a hobby and then it turns into a career and you find yourself singing 20 days in a row yeah. and your body just can't cope because you you don't have the foundation yeah, of the right. technique yeah it's very like it's and even i'm even like convincing myself as i talk now in real time because like <laughs> there are even last night i was like oh god this is taking ages like i need to i want to be able to sing the way i'm used to singing right. but it's just it's very it's just logical like if you do it from there yeah. you'll be all right but yeah um, it did strike me looking at that story as well that like you know and maybe as an example of where you're like the, one of the, like the fan bases you are picking up that there was as much talk about like when you made that statement about the cancer like about your handwriting yeah like people, that, there's yeah. as many people yeah. kind of saying well it's mad isn't it like no one writes these days <laughs> it's like and i had i had cancelled <clears throat> gigs the previous week and and i had written this thing out on my phone and mm. put up a screenshot of the notes and everyone was everyone was crazy supportive which mm. was lovely but I had done that twice and then I was like, I'm not doing a typed out thing again. I need right. to write it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then you got praise for your handwriting. It was a mixed bag though. Some people hated it. Some <laughs> people were like, I can't read that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's funny that that's what, you know, people pick up on as well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, Dermot, listen, it's been really fascinating listening Thanks, to man. you. And I love the album and the best of luck with everything. It's been nice, great man. having you here. Thank, Thank you. you. It was great. Loved having Dermot Kennedy in the studio today. Dermot's album, Without Fear, is out now. Um, before we go, don't forget to subscribe to Ireland Unfiltered on all the usual channels. And if you like the show, please leave a review.